Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, let's get our second heat underway. So I'm going to introduce our first participant in heat two, Rashid Desi. Uh, he is um, pursuing his Master of Health Science in Health Informatics, presenting heart rate variability as a predictor of anemia in premature infants. Rashid is a medical laboratory technician, researcher, consultant, and instructor who did his undergrad at Ontario Tech. He's traveled 16 countries across three continents and has conducted research projects in two of these countries. Rashid is also a diehard Toronto sports fan. Please welcome Rashid. Hi there, are you all set? Okay. All set. Do, oh, perfect. I was going to say you want to do a quick mic test, test, but okay, we'll start the timer. So today I want to take you guys on a journey. We're going to compare oil changes with blood transfusions. So let's say you're driving down, it's a beautiful day, you have a brand new car, and the next thing you hear is a beep. You look down in your dashboard and you see the oil symbol lit up. You go to a mechanic to get it checked. Now, the mechanic will check for two things. They'll check for the quality of the oil and the quantity of the oil. If either are not well or not good, then they will replace the oil. So 80 to 90% of premature infants are commonly admitted into the neonatal intensive care unit because of their premature state. While they're there, a big occurrence in this population is anemia. So anemia is a reduction of functional red blood cells that carry oxygen to your tissues. It is diagnosed through a protein known as hemoglobin. If the hemoglobin levels are low, then we perform something known as a red blood cell top up or a blood transfusion. Now, hemoglobin is detected through a blood draw. The challenge within the premature infant population is that they don't produce red blood cells in the first three months of life. This means that every time that we want to diagnose this, we have to draw blood. It starts this cycle where you take blood and then if the levels are low, you have to give blood. You can kind of start seeing the comparisons between the oil change and the blood draw. In the oil change, you had that indication system and then the quality and quantity were checked and then oil was topped up. In the blood draw, you have checking the blood. If the level of the hemoglobin is low, then you have to do a blood transfusion. Now, you see what's missing here? There was no indication system like my car had. But what if I told you there was a better way? Right now, premature babies are consistently monitored using um, healthcare monitoring devices. They're monitored at the bedside. My thesis focuses on using heart rate variability and anemia using an artificial intelligence system known as Artemis. Artemis can take physiological streaming data from these monitors and analyze, store, and process it in real time. This means that the heart rate information that is currently being unused can be put through heart rate variability algorithms. If the, if the trend of heart rate variability is concerning, the system can create an alert to let physicians know that they need to intervene. This is huge. This means that I can potentially reduce the amount of blood draws, reduce the resultant amount of blood transfusions, but most importantly, I can better life outcomes for these premature infants. Using this approach, we can have a patient-centered approach for healthcare with the power of artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rashid. We'll give the judges a few moments to complete their scorecards. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next participant, Michael Lombardo pursuing his Master of Science in Computer Science, presenting Understanding Genetic Model Maps. Michael has always been involved in high-level sports and has achieved national championships multiple times. His life turned around when he discovered computer science. Who would have known that talent with a stick and typing go hand in hand? Please welcome Michael. Hi there. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. I am good to go whenever you are. All right. Let's start the timer. All right. So. Imagine you're a brand new biology researcher and you're tasked with modifying some gene. It could be anything. And you go instinctively look around at papers, spending countless hours with not even finding anything of use. Wouldn't it be nice if with a single search of a keyword or an image, we were actually able to find all of the related works of our particular niche? This is the future and its foundation might be right in front of you. It's time that we use applications of computer vision and deep learning to rapidly increase the productivity of biology and chemistry. Visual illustrations and scholarly works 
are often used by bio biology researchers to distill the information discovered about a gene. What we're going to try to do is we want to try to find how these researchers' contributions fit into the grand scheme of things. That was how their discoveries will be conveyed. Today, I introduce our deep learning pipeline that creates an understanding of visual illustrations. This is by determining what genes and relationships are present in a given diagram. This will be the backbone of the next generation of bioinformatics tools. Specifically, we concentrate on a widely researched gene, Arabidopsis thaliana. And from the perspective of a computer scientist, it's just a plant. But for a biologist, it's a widely researched gene. We collected over 100,000 images on PubMed, which contained over 250,000 diagrams, PubMed being a database for bioinformatics works. We are interested in genetic model maps, similar to the image shown uh, on my slide. So I'll give everyone a second quickly just to look at it. There's a lot going on here, a lot of genes, a lot of relationships. We are capable of actually outputting all present pairs without any prior knowledge. These pairs explicitly state what type of relationship is present in between two genes, such as activation, inhibition, and stimulation. Now, more than ever, researchers require quick solutions. This tool will allow them to spend less time finding and scrambling for information and more time on finding futuristic solutions to our problems. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. We'll give the judges a few moments now. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next participant, Irvi Pajanker, who is pursuing her Master of Science in Applied Bioscience, presenting Predicting Metal Contamination in Fish, Using Blood Plasma and Snot as Non-Lethal Indicators. Irvi enjoys painting, hiking, reading, and listening to podcasts about aquatic toxicology and cooking. Irvi has resided in three countries and has a fraternal twin. Please welcome Irvi. Hi, Irvi. All set? Hi, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me well? Very well. Yep. Okay, let's get started. Yep, I'm ready. Water is life. This precious compound has made life on Earth possible. We humans especially depend on a daily supply of fresh water for various purposes. However, industrial and mining effluents are being discharged into water bodies without adequate treatment and regulation, making this nectar of life a poisonous portion of human waste. We need air to breathe, and aquatic wildlife need water to survive. Thus, these organisms can unfortunately suffer from unnaturally contaminated waterways. My research deals with the effects of a metal contaminant called nickel in fish. Upon exposure, nickel can be cancer-inducing in humans, and in fish, it can negatively impact reproduction, respiration, and behavior, among many other effects. However, a delay in the detection of biological stress can be deleterious for fish populations. Many fish species are culturally important, and the fisheries generate over $5 billion in Canada every year. Understanding the early indicators of stress by nickel, a metal with growing utility, is vital for monitoring the health of our fish populations. This is where my research steps in. My thesis studies the biological response to contamination using blood plasma and snot in fish. Sounds a little gross, I agree, but the mucus in uh, the skin mucus of fish is its first line of defense, producing an array of proteins that have protective properties. Blood plasma, the liquid component of blood, is an incredibly informative network and transports proteins to and from different parts of the body. Moreover, sampling blood and mucus is non-lethal, replacing conventional methods of fish sacrifice for research. It is also completely harmless for the fish, Kind of like getting a regular blood test or a COVID swab. It can get a little uncomfortable, uh, but they'll be fine. 
So proteins expressed by the mucus and plasma are environmentally sensitive and modify their response as uh, according to the environment. If the alterations in the amount and the set of proteins known as the proteome of an organism are detected early, they can help prevent the progression of harmful effects. Thus, comparing the changes in the proteome of nickel exposed and nickel unexposed fish can help diagnose the status of fish health and indirectly assess contamination. Without clean water, there is no life. Let us work on protecting life through innovative research that is non-lethal, predictive, and preventative. Thank you. Thank you, Irvi. We'll give the judges a few moments for their scorecards. Okay, we'll introduce our next participant, um, Devontae Campbell, uh, pursuing his uh, Master's of Health Science in Kinesiology, presenting subclinical neck pain alters cerebellar processing as demonstrated by disruptions in the ocular motor, <laughs> motor reflexes. I almost got it. Devante has played guitar for almost 10 years and draws a lot of inspiration from B.B. King. Devante is a huge Blue Jays and Raptors fan. His favorite musical artists are J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar. Please welcome Devante. Yeah, can you all hear me well? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Okay. All right, let's start that timer. Picture this. You just finished your fifth online lecture of the week or your third two-hour Zoom meeting for work. And now you're starting to experience a little bit of neck pain. And due to the ongoing state of the pandemic, this neck pain has become a recurrent issue in your life. See, what you may be experiencing is a very specific form of neck pain known as subclinical neck pain, or SCMP for short. See, SCMP is defined as recurrent episodes of mild to moderate neck pain that has not yet received treatment. And due to the majority of the population operating in the online world right now, this prevalence of SCMP is bound to rise. Well, why is this an issue, you may ask? Well, one common symptom seen in individuals with SCMP who also partake in prolonged screen time is dizziness. However, most people just brush off this dizziness as eye fatigue or altered vision due to scaring at a screen for too long. But what if this dizziness was actually due to a combination of both the neck pain and this altered vision, or more specifically, alterations in our eye movement reflexes? In our daily lives, there are two eye movement reflexes that we have to rely upon in order to maintain proper balance and coordination. The first of those being the cervical ocular reflex, or COR for short. See, the COR maintains our vision by keeping our eyes stable in our eye sockets as our body is rotating from left to right. For example, my eyes stay fixated at the center of the screen as my body rotates left to right in my chair. Although to fully maintain our body's balance and coordination, the COR must work in conjunction with another eye movement reflex known as the vestibulo-ocular reflex, or VOR for short. Now the VOR maintains our vision by moving movements in the opposite direction and at the same speed of a head rotation. For example, when you're saying no to somebody by shaking your head, such as this. And interestingly, research has demonstrated that neck pain may alter the body's ability to maintain our eye movement reflexes. However, the issue is that majority of these studies have not looked at these alterations from a neurological perspective. And that's where we come in. Both these eye movement and reflexes are directly controlled by a region of our brain known as the cerebellum. And one of the roles of the cerebellum is to maintain our body's balance and coordination by taking in sensory information from all across our body. And recently, research has shown that SCMP may alter the cerebellum's ability to maintain our balance and coordination, therefore leading to the disruptions we see in these eye movement reflexes in individuals with SCMP. This also may account for some of the adverse symptoms we see in individuals with SCMP, such as dizziness, headaches, and vertigo. By using high-speed eye tracking technology, my study aims to investigate the relationship between alterations in these eye movement reflexes and the cerebellum in individuals with SCMP. By understanding how SCMP alters these eye movement reflexes, we may be able to develop treatment plans in order to improve the balance and coordination in individuals with SCMP, such as chiropractic care and physiotherapy. Now, if you excuse me, I think I'm gonna put my laptop away for a while. All the screen time has made my neck a little bit stiff. Thank you. Thanks, Devante. We'll give the judges a few moments soon. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next participant, Michael Waterworth, um, studying for his Master's of Health Science in Kinesiology presenting exo exoskeletons, shoulder fatigue, and overhead work. Michael was born in Stratford, Ontario, and grew up not far from the shores of Lake Huron. Michael enjoys video games, sports, and playing the drums. Please welcome Michael. You all set, uh, Michael? Hi. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you hear me OK? Perfectly. OK, we'll get started. When I was a kid, 
I wanted to be just like Iron Man. The idea that technology could be used to grant myself superhuman strength fascinated me. And in the near future, my childhood fantasy may become a reality. How many people here have spent a full day working with their arms overhead, only to come home and have sore, fatigued shoulders the next day? I know I have. Despite overhead work's problematic nature, it cannot be entirely eliminated from the workplace. Therefore, interventions must be developed to reduce levels of both shoulder fatigue and injury. In addition to more traditional ergonomic interventions, exoskeletons have been introduced to the industrial work environment globally, particularly in the automotive sector. Upper limb exoskeletons are wearable structures that alleviate the load at the shoulder joint by transferring a portion of the arm's weight to a hip belt. Exoskeletons work in tandem with the user to support their body segments and augment human performance. Now, in theory, exoskeletons reduce the amount of force required by the worker to hold their arms overhead. However, limited fatigue research has actually been conducted. And since upper limb exoskeletons were introduced to the industrial work environment so rapidly, little is actually known regarding their effectiveness as a fatigue intervention. With this in mind, General Motors contacted me to investigate whether or not exoskeletons are an effective fatigue intervention for overhead work tasks. To address the current lack of literature, I aim to investigate three different commercially available models of exoskeleton during a fatiguing overhead work protocol. By measuring the user's level of muscle activity and strength with the exoskeletons and comparing them to their without exoskeleton baseline, we can ascertain whether or not these exoskeletons are actually an effective fatigue intervention for reducing fatigue during overhead work. The ultimate outcome of this research is to understand how we can best reduce fatigue using exoskeletons. Reduction in shoulder fatigue will reduce the risk of occupational injury, decreasing the overall burden on the Canadian healthcare system, while concurrently increasing moral and financial outcomes for the Canadian automotive sector. All things considered, current exoskeletons may not grant me superhuman strength like Iron Man, but they may be the secret to preventing fatigue and injury during overhead work tasks. Thank you, Michael. We'll give the judges uh, a few minutes for their scorecards. Okay, with okay. our next participant, Ibrahim Adam, who is pursuing his Master's of Applied Science in Nuclear Engineering presenting Feasibility of Nuclear Renewable Hybrid Energy Systems for Large Ship. Ibrahim is from Bangladesh and loves to travel to unfamiliar but beautiful places. He loves to play cricket and football, loves spicy food, and the people of Canada for their welcoming nature. Please welcome Ibrahim. <laughs> you all set? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, okay we'll get started. Uh, for your information, today the price of a single Bitcoin is 70,000 CAD. You're probably not thinking about buying a Bitcoin, but if you want to trade, you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin, which is called Satoshi, and it is only 0.02 cent. Similarly, if you want to use nuclear energy for a small community in a remote location, you don't need to build a Darlington power plant. You can use a fraction of Darlington power plant called a small modular reactor, SMR, and you can even transport it on a truck. This coolest feature of SMR has created a number of new application areas, which we didn't think of 10 years back. Large merchant ship is one of the areas where we can use SMR. If global shipping were a country, it would be considered as the sixth largest producer of carbon dioxide gas. And it is responsible for more than 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Renewable energy like solar energy and wind energy are free from emissions, but they are not capable to fulfill the huge demand of these large ships. So in general, renewable energy is mixed with fossil fuel based energy system in the new marine ships. But this energy mix is not free from emissions because of the presence of fossil fuel. But now we can use SMR instead of fossil fuel based generators in large ships. But before implementing any new technology, we need to find out the answer of three important questions. Number one, is it technically feasible? Number two, is it economically viable? And number three, is it environment friendly? My research is to find out the answer of these three questions. Under the data license agreement, a German ship tracking company 
Fuismon has provided the position, speed, and direction of a oil tanker. By using this information, I have estimated the energy requirement of that large ship. A simulation software is used to assess the technical feasibility of using nuclear renewable hybrid energy system in marine ships. The system cost is measured by considering all the life cycle cost of each component of the system. My findings show that it is technically feasible to use nuclear renewable hybrid energy system in marine ships, and it costs half of the current technology that is being used in the marine ships. And the carbon dioxide emission is 150 times less than the fossil fuel based generators. I believe these findings will motivate all the stakeholders to think about the usage of nuclear energy in marine ship in, new, in near future. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Our judges will now uh, take a few moments to complete their scorecards. Okay, I'll introduce our next participant, Yusuf al -Shuesh pursuing his Master's of Applied Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering, presenting innovative charging solutions for paths to sustainable and resilient transportation. Yusuf is an EV evangelist and sustainability enthusiast. Yusuf has lived, studied, and worked in seven countries across four continents. His wide range of interests include future technology, cosmo cosmology, philosophy, and sports. Please welcome Yusuf. Hi, Yusuf. Okay, we'll get started. Okay, thanks. Transitioning from conventional vehicles to electric vehicles is one of the most viable solutions to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, the electric mobility is expanding as Transport Canada is projecting that all vehicles will be 100% uh, electric by 2040. Uh, this is a call for us to uh, plan effectively for reliable and efficient charging infrastructure. To quickly recharge the EV battery, a huge amount of power is required. While the existing power distribution system has limitations as the uh, power capacity is limited and also they employ conventional transformers that are inefficient and they rely on manual switching uh, that usually leads to power outages. So state transformer uh, or known as SSD is a very promising uh, technical solution that hasn't been employed yet. And this is where my research comes in. My uh, thesis focuses on designing a charging system utilizing the SSD-based power converters uh, that can be used to recharge the EV batteries quickly and efficiently. This design is modular, scalable, and uh, extendable. Uh, that is also based on several semiconductor uh, transistor switching devices that accommodate for high power density to recharge uh, the electric vehicles uh, without requiring significant upgrades to the power grid. It also features smart protection, which means high power quality and also reliability. It also allows for bidirectional power flow, which enables to uh, maximize the use of a EV battery by 10 times uh, compared to the conventional charging. And the reason is most of the time, the, there is a huge additional energy stored in the EV that could be used to provide ancillary services to support the utilities. Imagine you could make money from these services uh, when your EV is just parked in the parking lots. Uh, for the, those houses with the solar PV panels, the EV could be used to store the sun's energy during the day, and it could be also reused to power the house at night. And when the battery is full, this system uh, would be fed to uh, the grid back uh, uh, when there is a demand. I also proposed a coordinated control strategy to optimize the use of energy stored in the EV battery, maximize the profits, and manage the energy uh, consumption. And this is based on a deterministic approach by asking the driver to uh, set only two uh, parameters uh, using uh, a mobile application, uh, which is the uh, drive uh, departure time and also the amount of energy they would like to have it. And then the intelligent controller will automatically ensure that the EV will be sufficiently charged and ready to depart at their desired time with the optimal uh, economic returns. I collaborated with an expert to uh, implement this controller in practice and obtain a very promising performance. The overall control scheme would allow for uh, generating at least $2,000 uh, per year as a revenue for each electric vehicle participating in the services. Using the solution does not only save time and money, but also saves our planet. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Yusuf. I will give the judges a few moments for their scorecards. 
Okay, I'm going to introduce our next participant, Ahmed Bader, who is pursuing his PhD in electrical and computer engineering, presenting real-time electrocardiogram monitoring and analysis. Ahmed's research interests lie in the areas of Internet of Things and healthcare, distributed systems, and cloud computing. During his Bachelor and Master of Science, he has conducted research on a variety of topics, including intelligent transportation systems, infrastructure, and smart grid applications. Please welcome Ahmed. Okay, hi everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, very well. Okay, um, started. Okay, so there's a shift in the healthcare landscape where everyone is moving towards preventive care. No one is looking at it. You got fitness and lifestyle companies focused on wellness, but not focused on heart care management, while medtech companies are focused just on medical devices. So there's a huge opportunity out there in an age where nearly everyone is digitally connected in some way. It only makes sense that the healthcare industry is seeing a lot of connected health devices and remote patient monitoring technologies. While in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, connected health and remote patient monitoring are more important than ever because simply they enable physicians to monitor patients without having to come into contact with them. And to demonstrate the pain, in 2016, over 17 million people died globally from cardiovascular disease, which represent 31% of all global death. About 160,000 Canadian adults are diagnosed with heart disease just every year, while in 2015, nearly 600,000 people died of heart disease, which made it the number one leading cause of death in the United States that year. So imagine how many lives could be saved if we had access to the patient's heart conditions remotely. Accordingly, in my research, I proposed a new platform to provide continuous remote ECG monitoring using a lightweight smart patch. The smart patch collects real-time signals using wearable and unobtrusive body sensors to not interrupt the patient's normal lifestyle for long-term cardiac diagnosis. And more importantly, it reduces time to response action whenever any life-threatening condition develops using a robust notification system. Besides providing accurate and deep analysis of the heart performance, as all abnormal responses are tagged and reported to the healthcare organization or even dispatching a 911 code. Our ECG patch has four main features. The first one, enabling physicians to gain 24 seven insight into their patients outside the four walls of the clinic. Secondly, provide a custom branded mobile application. Thirdly, provide access to all medical records through a web-based clinical dashboard. Fourthly, broadcast notifications using smart home devices What's even better, the system is scalable, customizable, delivering a clinic's unique protocol focusing on the data the clinic needs at the moment it needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. We'll give the judges a few moments with their scorecards. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next participant, Caitlin Hines, uh, pursuing her Master of Arts in Education, presenting Journey Through the Rabbit Hole an artographic in inquiry of becoming an online higher education. Caitlin is a freelance illustrator, nature lover, and avid reader. She is consistently inspired by a deep sense of curiosity and passion for learning. Caitlin is currently pursuing her Master of Arts in Education while working as a research assistant, and she strives to find harmony between her academic and artistic endeavors. Please welcome Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Hi. <laughs> I can hear you just fine. So Perfect. let's start that timer. Have you ever written a paper and thought, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever done? Only think to yourself later, embarrassed, and say, did I do that? That was horrible. Have you ever felt so passionate or so driven by a research question or field of study only to enter, enter an academic space that makes you feel inadequate, intimidated, burnt out, fearful of making mistakes? If you answered no to any of these questions, please tell me your secrets. If you answered yes to any or all or one of these statements, hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm a freelance illustrator studying education, and no matter what field or faculty you're a part of, I'm happy to admit that we have something in common. As I made the shift from an arts undergrad to my current online graduate studies, I experienced a pretty big shock. I moved from a communal studio space to being physically alone, yet virtually connected with dozens of amazing educators and professionals that I didn't feel connected to at all. 
In my first course, these feelings were paralyzing. After remaining silent for the entire semester, I decided to take a risk. For the final presentation, I opened up and discussed my feelings of impostorship. To my surprise, the chat box overflowed with compassion. For the first time, I felt connected with my peers because, well, as it turns out, we all feel like imposters. But I have some concerns. Why do we consider it normal to feel this way? And why don't we ever really talk about it? Inspired by my humble beginnings and the tension between my arts and academic identities, my research focuses on the impact of academic culture and norms as we live, study, and work online. In my research, I transgress against mainstream research practices by being vulnerable. Rather than providing a solution to a specific problem, I recursively discuss and generate questions. I weave together personal narrative, metaphor, illustration, and critical theories to reflect on my academic journey and openly challenge my assumptions and the academic system as I perceive it. A system whose arbitrary rules I feel perpetuate norms that benefit a small few while convincing the rest that they are solely to blame for their lack of success. A system of rigid maze-like structures that even online normalize things like burnout, individualism, and gatekeeping. To subvert these structures, my research starts a conversation, like the risk I took during my first semester, and now I want to connect with you through sharing stories. We all have our own unique and shared experiences, especially over this past year, so I challenge you to take a step back and reflect from a different perspective. Look back at that horrible paper and celebrate how far you've come. Enter academic spaces and embrace the discomfort of not knowing and the potential in making mistakes while extending the same grace to others. My research challenges you to question why things are the way they are so that it may inspire you to forge new and easier to navigate paths, to normalize taking care and taking breaks, to normalize failure as a chance to grow. If I have learned anything over this past year, it's that new normals are possible. As we move further online and further into the future, I emphasize the need for better, more equitable, more responsive spaces in higher education so that students are able to reach their full potential in supportive environments that aren't riddled with barriers or ruled by fear and tension, because there is no perfect student, researcher, professional, or any person. There is only becoming and only growth. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Our judges will now take a few moments with their score sheets. Okay, I'm gonna introduce our next and last participant for heat two, Rachel McTeer, who is uh, pursuing her master's in health science and kinesiology. Uh, presenting the effects of four weeks of HIT training in junior swimmers. Rachel spent six months in New Zealand working on farms. Please welcome Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi, can you hear me okay? Oh, perfectly. Okay, we'll start the timer. Not too long ago, I was backing out of the driveway and I got stuck in a snowbank. Before I knew it, I was sitting there spinning my wheels going absolutely nowhere. I want you to take a look at the screen for a moment. These kids, they felt like they were going somewhere. They were seeing and feeling what it's like for hard work to pay off. Now, swimming is a bit of a unique sport. Athletes train up to 20 hours a week for events that typically last less than three minutes. That's a lot of opportunity for spinning wheels, potentially going nowhere. So in this study, we wanted to take a closer look. What is happening in these 20 hours of training? First, we monitored training and performance for 10 weeks. We measured internal training load using a scale of perceived exertion and had both the coach and swimmers rate each practice from 1 to 10. We looked at training monotony, which is a measure of the variability within a training program, and we used a swim-based performance test to track peak blood lactate and average speed to see if athletes were improving over time. We found that coach and swimmer ratings of perceived exertion did not match up, meaning the athletes weren't getting the intended training stimulus. We saw high training monotony in eight out of the 10 weeks where values exceeded a threshold of two, which has been linked to injury and illness. Looking at our performance variables, we saw a significant decrease in peak blood lactate, as well as a meaningful decrease in average speed. Overall, athletes got slower. Combine these two performance changes and we get the definition of overtraining. Intense training without adequate recovery resulting in a decrease of performance. Spinning your wheels, some might say. The next step in our study was to add two weekly high-intensity interval training sessions into the program to see if intensity had an effect on performance. After four weeks of added intensity, we retested the athletes to see, and <laughs> we retested the athletes, and we saw an increase in peak blood lactate as well as an increase in average speed. Overall, athletes got faster. So why does this matter? 
With one in 10 boys and one in three girls leaving sport by their teenage years, the conversation on how we keep kids in sport is a popular one. I believe the coach's role in directing kids down the path of success is critical in increasing their motivation and enjoyment of sport. These kids up on the screen, they earn those medals. That's all them. But the coach is responsible for providing direction. And this just might be the bottleneck. In fact, coaches often don't comply with scientific intervention. This can make sports science research challenging, but the information from studies such as this one can provide a roadmap for experimentation. Just like with our athletes, we don't want coaches spinning their wheels. That is doing what has always been done and seeing minimal results. We need to continue the research in youth sport and open up the conversation so these swimmers and many more can see and experience their hard work pay off. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We'll give the judges a few moments. Okay, thank you to all of our students from Heat 2. You all did amazing. That was so great to watch. Um, so before we begin our third and final heat, we'll be taking about a 45 minute uh, break. So please be sure to uh, sign back in prior to 1245 when we're going to start uh, Heat 3. So um, yeah, grab some food, grab a coffee, and we'll see you uh, back at 1245.